if you if you go pretty much anywhere, um, particularly in the United Kingdom, I guess, although I think it's true in other places, of course, uh, and you go to any any village or uh, town or city, um, if you if you lift up your eyes, you will see that the skyline is littered by great big huge churches with pointy steeples, you know, or, or great big domes and basilica, and uh, London's especially great for that. You know, if you can get yourself a good place in London, uh, like Primrose Hill, and you can, you know, in the posh bit of London, you can stand there and look over the skyline, you can see St Paul's Cathedral, all these grand, all these big grand places. And if you look across the world, places like the, there's a big dome thing in Florence, I can't remember the name of it right now, but it's this great big grand dome, which is a, a church built to glorify God. And then if you go to, you know, all, all the way around the world, you'll find these massive, great big, huge buildings uh, with big, you know, spires supposed to be pointing up to God. One of my favourites is um, uh, Durham Cathedral. Anyone been to Durham Cathedral? Uh, love it. Great place. And especially if you're coming into Durham on the train, uh, you come in on the train and over on the left you can see this great big huge cathedral uh, just standing proud on that little promontory there, just, you know, sort of saying something. Uh, and all these things, of course, when, when they were conceived in the minds of those who were building them, um, from, the, from the smallest church you know, building to, to the, even the biggest in the world, that there's something in the mindset of, we want to point out that God's quite good, you know? <laughs> we want to point out that God's quite great. Uh, we want to point out that God is magnificent and, and, and sort of somehow worthy of all these grand uh, spars. And when you're in some of those places, um, you, you can get that sense of, that sense of, wow, this is, this is amazing. Um, and the invitation is to go beyond, wow, this is amazing, to thinking, God is amazing. It doesn't always happen. You know, but sometimes, sometimes these big expressions of, of buildings for God, you know, sometimes they can just be the sort of um, the reflections of people's own ideas of their own power and their own influence. You know, when the Normans uh, came to these lands, they built these big cathedrals everywhere. And yes, they were saying something about God, but they were saying something about themselves as well. Uh, we are saying we are here to rule and to reign. And so there's a sense of wanting to magnify God. But when you look into the New Testament, there's something really different that God is doing and inviting the world to look at in order to see the majesty of God. Uh, and, and in my case, it's 18 and a bit stone of just this. You know, it, it's, this is, this is the, the normal everyday people of God is what God invites people to look to in order that they may see the grandeur and the wonder of who this God is. Because when God gets his hands on a people and brings them together, as we're reminding ourselves last week, there is something powerful and beautiful. A people that are being made into the likeness of Jesus Christ. And so what does Jesus Christ look like? You know, he doesn't really look like Durham Cathedral. Um, glorious as it is. He looks like a bunch of ragtag like you and me, as I've often said, gathered together. Because there, in the midst of us, his presence is manifest. And we see that particularly here in this passage, and particularly uh, in the Thessalonican church as a whole. Um, if you, if you, I don't know when the last time was you read First Thessalonians. Do you know where to find First Thessalonians? I hope you do. Um, but it's, it, we get the sense that actually this, this, this church... They're doing pretty well. They've, they've got a reasonably good life together. Uh, there's lots that Paul writes and he, he's pleased with what's happening amongst them. He can see the testimony of God working its way through their lives into the society as a whole. When people heard about the church of Thessalonica, the first thing they think of, ah, oh, they're good people. They're good people, and there's amazing things <coughs> happening with them. That, that's a, that's a, I mean, you can't get any better than that, can you? I, I've, I've asked you this before as well. When you mention Aaron Baptist Church on the Isle of Arran, what do people say? <coughs> oh, I don't know. What do they say? You could go and ask them. You could, go, you could do a little, a little poll in the street. But if I say to you, Aaron Baptist Church, what do you say? You might get a whole lot of things. 
But what we're told is that there's something about these Thessalonians, uh, Thessalonians that, were, that was a, a testimony. <coughs> God was doing something in them. And I want to just focus, uh, before we come around the Lord's table, on two particular things that I think that we can be learning from this church, but also that we can be fleshing out in our own lives. And first of all, in verses 9 and 10, it says this. Now, about your love for one another, we don't need to write to you, for you yourselves have been taught by God to love each other. And in fact, you do love all of God's family throughout Macedonia. We urge you, brothers and sisters, to do more and more. The Thessalonian church was known for its love for one another. That is huge. That is huge. I've known churches that are known for their good singing. I've known churches that are, have, are known for their good cakes. And that is one thing they say about Aaron Baptist Church. They'll feed you and give you diabetes. <laughs> That's what they say about us. Um, but, you, 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 but I've known churches that are, are, that are good because they, they, they sort of roll up their sleeves and they do stuff. Or, or, or another church because, well, they're the praying church. Or the other one because, oh, they're the social justice church. Or they're the this, that, and the next thing. But the Thessalonians were known for their love. They were known for their love. Why is that so important? Because it was Jesus who said, by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. And Paul tells us that God had taught the Thessalonians to love one another. It strikes me, you know, I mean, this is a very simple thing to say. It's very easy to love someone if you're not actually involved in their life. You know, I, I can say, oh, I love you if I've got nothing to do with you and you don't, you don't wind me up or, or you don't get under my skin or, or we've never had to sort of flesh something out. I, I, can, I can love something away over there. But when we turn towards each other in community and live in community, and in their case, living as Christian community in a non-Christian environment. But for, for it to be said about them, look at how they love one another. God has taught them this love. It's something beyond what is humanly possible. We can see something of what God intends. And so I want to ask you this morning, do you love one another? Do you love one another? And my, my wee sense... Is that yes, we do. But my other wee sense is we don't really know each other. Uh, we don't really know each other to love one another in the way that every human disciple, every human person really needs to find the love of community. Because that love can only be fostered when we're not sitting looking at the bald patch of the person in front. <laughs> <laughs> but, but when we're standing face to face, eye to eye, and when there is a love that leads to a certain vulnerability where we can share about what's going on in our lives, that's where love starts to transform. And I think that's what Jesus was talking about. Not just loving people as a concept out there at a distance, but knowing people and loving them all the same in the same way that Jesus loved his disciples even the one that would betray him. Sitting next to Judas, holding a love for him, even though he was about to do what he was going to do. It's a love that's face to face. It's a love that's round the table. It's love in a circle facing each other. And we need that love because there's parts of me that will only come fully alive when I receive the love of God through the community of the fellowship, which will enable my life to sing, which will enable me to flourish, because otherwise I am desperately alone. I am desperately alone without the Christian community of brothers and sisters. I've been a Christian now, I think it's 26 years, and it's not long. You know, I've been in churches, I've been in leadership of churches for you know, 20 years or something like that. And there have been so many years, so many times, even in the biggest, shiniest congregations where I've sometimes stood up on a Sunday and thought, I feel so alone. I feel so alone. There's something nice about this congregation, but I actually don't know how to love me. This is not just me. I think it's the experience of other people. 
What is it about these Thessalonians? They had found this God-taught love, which was enabling them to come together and produce something whereby when you were outside looking in on it, they could say, there goes God. There goes God. That, that's one of the things that every fellowship of God's people has to grapple with. Where is the love? And when the love leaks out, you might as well just go home, you know? When the love leaks out, you might as well just go home. So I want to, I want to tell you I love you. I want to know you better. I don't want to know you. On a Sunday morning, you're standing there looking at me, some of you half awake. I, I, I want to know you in a different way so that when it, it gets difficult that we can, we can express that love that comes from God the Father and we can be that love and support. Paul, writing to Romans, it digs in a little bit deeper and he opens up what he means by, by this love. He says, love must be sincere, hate what is evil, cling to what is good, be devoted to one another in love. Honour one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervour serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, joyful, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn, etc., etc., etc. In other words, love is not a concept and an idea. Love is something that is fleshed out one with another. Who's the first person that I should be able to go to if I need care and love and support and encouragement and blessing? This is what's different. The world doesn't have that, you know. They have, we have our families and we have our friends, but nothing even like, remotely like the Church of Jesus Christ. And that might not be how it exactly is at the moment, but it's what we are hoping for. When love is planted deep, in the heart of his people. We're no longer separate silos, but we are a family. We are a people of God with God's presence in our midst. And it should blossom to be something beautiful. Do you hunger and thirst for that? I hunger and thirst for that. That we go beyond the superficialities of Sunday morning meetings to be community on a Monday morning when it really matters. So these Les Les Loins had had a familial love. How do you make God visible? By your love. For one another. Moving on, I've got a new, I've got a new um, sentence, which is my new aim for my life, and it's in this verse. It's in this verse, uh, verse eleven to thirteen says, "And make it your ambition to lead a quiet life. <laughs> make it your ambition to lead a quiet life. You should mind your own business and work with your hands, just as we told you." so that your daily life may win the respect of outsiders and so that you will not be dependent on anybody. Ambition. What is that? That word ambition is something which drives people to the absolute extremes of busyness and stress and angst and searching and yearning. Make it your ambition, Paul says, to what? Live a quiet life. You know? And that's, uh, again, that's particularly pertinent to me as somebody who's been standing on platforms for 20 years who haven't, hasn't often been able to have a quiet life, you know? Even on my day off when I go for a coffee or somebody wants to come in, you know, it's like, it's like a quiet life, you know? Make it your ambition to live a quiet life, you know? And, and that might seem countercultural, uh, uh, certainly today, but even then, because here, here, here are these disciples, they of course had a message. They of course had a message. And these would be people who would be proclaimers of the gospel. These are not silent set at home types, really. They've got a message. They're displaying the love of God. But, but, but Paul's saying that as well as the, the gospel that you're proclaiming by your mouth and by your community together, there is something intrinsic about the way that you live. A, a, a non-anxious presence in the world, as John Mark Comer says. And if ever there was a need for people who can live a quiet life and display an alternative way of living, it is the church of Jesus Christ. Because in him we are at peace. The striving is gone. Live a quiet life. 
and then be not being dependent on it. That, that's that's about you know them in the context of society, not having to be relying on people outside the Christian community to make them because they recognise persecution is coming, trouble is coming. So make it so that you're prepared to live your life as a Christian community in the context of the world that you're in. That's what that's you're on about. I want to ask you a question. You ready for a question? Here's a question. What did Jesus do between the age of 12 and 30? You know, what was you doing at 23? What were you doing at 23? That's a rhetorical question. I don't want to know. <laughs> what, were you doing at tw- what was Jesus doing at 23? Well, he was, he was becoming a carpenter, you know. What was he doing at 25? He was becoming a better carpenter, you know, 28, you know, even 29 before he, you know, sort of went out and he was, he was just making it his ambition to live a quiet life and work with his hands, you know, something totally honourable about that, about living in this world as a testament to the fact that God is God and that all we have and all that we need is found in him. There's a little passage that Jesus, a uh, little sentence that Jesus utters in, in the Gospels. And he says, whoever can be trusted with very little can be trusted with much. And whoever is dishonest with very little will be dishonest with much. The small things matter. And, and it's taken me a long, long, long time. Like I think it does for most people to realise that the small things matter and I'm not there yet. But it's then finding our ways to rejoice in the small things and actually saying, actually... The way that I do this is a testimony. The way that I do this is a testimony to what? To me, no. But to the order that God has amongst his people. To the way that we live in him. Pay attention to your everyday life. Because you know what happens. Don't you? They're watching. <laughs> they're, they're watch- you know that. They're watching. They are watching every conversation, every interaction. I know sometimes we're aware of how much we fail. And we come back to our knees and say, Lord, I, I messed that one up. But yeah, they're watching and it's such a power. They'll, they'll, they'll listen to what you do. Uh, and they will listen to what, how you treat one another before they will listen to anything that comes out of your mouth. This is the way of the world and yet we do not stop speaking. Jesus says in the same way, Let your light shine before others so that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. There is something about the everyday practical life lived in the life of the Son, which is speak. So there you are. Nothing which should really give you sleepless nights tonight, folks. No big, you know, big challenging message tonight, Charlotte. Nothing that will give you indigestion, but just a gentle encouragement. For us to be seeking after the familial love that is found in the community of Jesus Christ. To really learn to love one another. To really learn what that means to know each other. And then to live a faithful life. A quiet life. Minding our own business. Working with our hands as a witness and a testimony to God. That's an unspectacular message, isn't it? But it is actually a transformative, <laughs> countercultural <clears throat> message to set away the striving, to set away the striving, and to be content just where you are. Do you have that? Do you have that? Are you content in Him? Do you know that you are exactly where He wants you to be? And do you want to step into those unforced rhythms of grace that He's pouring into your life so that you can live for Him?